Greetings and salutations friends and welcome back to some more Warhammer 40k lore. Today we will be taking a look at the Imperial Guard, also known as the Astra Militarum. The Imperial Guard, or Astra Militarum, whichever you prefer, is the largest organised fighting force in the galaxy, consisting of uncounted billions of men and armoured vehicles. The Imperial Guard is humanity's reactionary force, used to crush invading Xenos and Chaos forces alike under the weight of the Imperium's Sledgehammer forces. But being the massive Sledgehammer that they are, is not their guard's only role. In fact, the Imperial Guard fills a variety of roles within the Imperium. They are a policing force, a garrison force, a rapid reaction force, static besiegers, invaders, blockading forces. The Imperial Guard can and will fill any role that is needed, with millions of more or less specialised regiments. Some may be experts in attrition warfare, others in rapid air base manoeuvres, others specialise in particular climates like deserts or frozen planets and others again specialise in the extermination of specific threats, alien or otherwise. For example, the Valhallans of the frozen ice world Valhalla take a particular dislike to orcs and have gotten pretty goddamn good at killing them. I will, of course, be covering these specialised regiments in their own videos, but for now, we will stick to the standard Imperial Guard Regiment, if such a thing could even be said to exist, as practically all regiments are equipped, trained and organised in more or less unique ways. For example, a regiment may have been posted to a feudal tech level world for generations, replenishing their numbers from the local population. There is an example of just such a regiment mentioned in one of the many, many books set in the 40k universe. A regiment that after generations of garrison duty fighting only minor skirmishes against the anti-imperial horse tribes of the planet, had developed a style of fighting more akin to that of 18th century warfare than the 41st century. They would form up in a square formation, and use a volley fire to repel the savage tribesmen. Even their equipment slowly but surely degraded as resupply was considered an ever lower and lower priority, leading the regiment to adopt simpler weapons in the form of Laz Lock rifles, a single shot Laz weapon. And in a style of warfare where camouflage was more or less completely superfluous, they started using uniforms more in line with the 18th century as well, simply because after several generations of hereditary command, the regiment became more of a status symbol rather than an actual fighting force. They became almost the planet's nobility and it became a bit of a status symbol for someone to marry into the great and mighty Imperial Guard. On the completely opposite side of the spectrum, we have the Elysian Drop Troopers, a high-tech regiment of entirely airborne troops. Using grav chutes and a variety of gunships to rapidly transport entire regiments of infantry and light armor with speed undreamt of by conventional forces. Virtually every single piece of kit, be it weapons, heavy, light, uniforms, helmets, all of it, is tailor-made for this very purpose, and are usually lighter and shorter than the standard weapons of other Imperial Guard regiments, and they even employ a fair few hyper-specialized weapons, like a light automatic mortar that can be set down by the highly mobile troops and then used via remote controls to cover the troops' advances making it completely unnecessary for the troops to set up and use a mortar emplacement like normal mortal infantry. And of course, a wide variety of carbine variations of the Laz rifle. I will of course be covering the illusions in a video all of their own, but I will now try to get back to my point with the standard Imperial Guard Regiment. On an organization level, most guard regiments are at least somewhat similar. A regiment is recruited from a single world, 
and is usually all male or all female regiments, though in some special cases, mixed regiments can be raised and normally, unisex regiments may be joined together after particularly brutal engagements, when the regiments in question are unable to receive adequate reinforcements from their own world, creating a scratch regiment, so to say. Now, naturally, recruiting from a world comes with a few problems, as you are limiting yourselves to a, in galactic terms, quite limited area. And, again, in such a massive scale area like a galaxy, this means that you have some pretty obvious problems. For example, the fact that the vast majority of Imperial worlds have widely varying customs, languages, and beliefs. Now, this last one requires a bit of a side note, though. While all Imperial worlds worship the Emperor as a god, many do so in different ways. For example, the natives of one world might think that the God Emperor lives inside their sun, and acts like a protecting spirit. On another world, the Emperor might be considered an avenging angel that came down from the heavens to drive off the bad people that were enslaving them. This is essentially one of those founding myths that go all the way back to Old Night. For example, let's say that a planet was occupied by a race of psychics that had enslaved the populace. Well, the Space Marine Legions would descend upon the planet and kill off the psychics, freeing the populace. And then, over the next few thousand years, this would then become a bit of a creation myth, essentially. Um, giving the Emperor the credit for their liberation, so to say. All of this, as you might expect, lead to some rather serious friction between regiments, and it is not at all unusual for there to be violence between particularly different regiments. For the most part, this is simply ignored by High Command as long as it does not impact too much on combat performance, as trying to solve all of the various problems, be they religious, be they class-based, be they tradition-based, etc, 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 between potentially hundreds, if not thousands of regiments, would be a nigh-on impossible task. Ignoring potentially fatal grudges and flaws aside, the Munitorium will insist on two things. Firstly, that the regiment confirm to Munitorium standards of a minimum of 3 and a maximum of 20 companies. These companies can, however, vary greatly in size, which means that a regiment can be everything from a few hundred men to tens of thousands strong. Secondly, all regiments will be formed into a single branch of the Imperial Guard be it artillery, infantry, armor, or specialized troops. Multiple regiments may be formed at the same time to supplement each other, but no single regiment may contain elements of two or more of the service branches. Though, as with all rules, there is always some exceptions, like for example, scratch regiments formed from whatever remnants were available, this last rule is pretty ironclad. Now, you may now be thinking, hold up Arch, separating the branches like that makes no sense whatsoever, they would be far more flexible and effective in combined arms units. And that is exactly the point. You see, after the whole Horus heresy, the Imperium got just a wee bit paranoid. And so they decide to split the branches, so that if a unit goes rogue, it will be severely hampered and easy to overcome by other units that are working together in combined arms formations, with several regiments cooperating and um, fulfilling each other. Now, of course, the command levels necessary to keep a smooth operation at that kind of level with various type of regiments, throwing all in all kinds of traditional religious and class-based differences, is an absolute bloody nightmare, you be damn fucking sure, 
but it's still better than the potential risk of rebellion. But moving on, the natural next question may be, do worlds raise one type of regiment? So for example, do they raise only artillery or only armor or multiple? Well, it depends entirely on the world in question. Naturally, it is far easier and cheaper to raise a regiment of infantry than one of armor or artillery, since the former requires access to a forge world and a hell of a lot more training. It's a hell of a lot easier to teach 10 men how to operate las rifles than it is to teach 10 men how to effectively coordinate and operate armored vehicles or artillery in a combined arms situation with other regiments they might never have even heard of and haven't the faintest idea why they keep worshipping the sun all the goddamn time. So, most worlds provide infantry regiments. In the case of a feral or feudal world, there are also cultural considerations that must be made. If you show a man who considers the horse and cart to be the bleeding edge of technology a Valkyrie gunship, he is unlikely to be able to pilot it overly expertly. Training these troops in the basics of modern warfare and how to operate their new weapons, las weapons, heavy bolters, etc is more than enough work already and the Imperium has a need of men now, and not in six years. And it would probably take six years to teach some feudal tech level bastard how to operate a helicopter, in this case a VTOL jet. As such, it is simply far more expedient to level infantry regiments, or cavalry regiments even, from these planets. Uh, additionally, of course, you gotta um, bear in mind that people recruited from these worlds, savage worlds, feudal tech level worlds with lots of combat and internal fighting, etc., are probably going to be pretty goddamn good melee fighters. As such, organizing them into what are essentially shock troop regiments designed to be the tip of a spearhead, utilizing other Imperial Guard regiments to offer covering fire and suppressing the enemy, while the feral offworlders rush up to them and kill them with the good old fashioned bayonet, or axe, or trench shovel, or sword, or all of the other various thingity bobs the feudals are more than likely to have brought from their home planets. On the other hand, industrious worlds, or war worlds, can raise entire armies with all the infantry, artillery, and tanks needed, while many other worlds take pride in creating one type of unit. For example, specializing in storm artillery, or heavy shock troops, or sappers, for example. And some worlds go even further, raising regiments of extremely specialized troops, or even specialized abhuman regiments. For example, there is a world in the Imperium, and probably several in fact, that is constantly shrouded in darkness. And over the generations, the inhabitants have let their sense of sight atrophy almost completely relying instead on other senses to guide them in the near total darkness, and these senses have grown stronger to make up for the loss of sight. It stands to reason, therefore, that these troops would be extremely effective at nighttime operations, or on other planets where the light level is naturally low. It should be noted, though, that extremely specialized regiments like this, or for example regiments of super heavy armor, or regiments of drops troops, or marksmen, infiltrators, demolition specialists, etc., are usually broken down into their smaller components, for example, company or even squad size, and attached to other regiments on a mission-to-mission -mission basis. For example, a regiment is tasked with the breaching of an enemy bunker complex. Well, in this case, it might be given a couple squads of specialized sapper troops to breach through the bunker walls or reinforced doors, for example. But now that I've mentioned abhumans in the Imperial Guard, I feel they require a special mention. 
Again, I will probably do a video on abhumans themselves at some point, but for now, the bare-boned basics, at least. As bare-boned as yours truly can make it. First up, what is a abhuman? An abhuman is a stable strain of mutated human that has been accepted by the Imperium as human enough to not be Xenos. And as such, they are considered human, and they are required to pay taxes and serve in the Imperium's armies. But they are pretty much always organized into separate regiments. The Imperium can be pretty xenophobic, and asking normal humans to fight alongside abhumans is asking for trouble. Though there are a fair few regiments that have come to value their abhuman brethren and their unique abilities. And whenever possible, these regiments are kept together simply because a regiment that has no experience fighting alongside abhumans are about as likely to shoot the abhumans as they are the enemy. But, of course, all that recruiting is all quite pointless without the weapons and equipment with which their men are to fight, so let's take a look at the standard outfit of an Imperial Guardsman. First and foremost, the French Imperial Guardsman is given his primary weapon, the Laz Gun. As the name suggests, this is a laser weapon with a considerable punch for its size and extremely flexible, both in its effective range and punch, and perhaps most importantly, the Lasgun power packs are not only reusable and rechargeable in the field, but quite compact and light, especially considering its far greater magazine capacity compared to solid slug weapons. Now, the exact numbers of times you can fire a laser weapon depends almost entirely upon the maker. Some makers allow their weapons to fire more powerful rounds, for example. That produces, of course, less shots. There are also variations in the power pack, in the um, punch of the weapon, etc, etc, etc. But, uh, moving on. As a standard, the Imperial Guardsman is issued with two to three power packs, and he is expected to recharge and keep using these two to three power packs pretty much forever. In reality though, Imperial Guardsman, just as any other um, Guardsman or soldier, reliant on ammunition consuming main weapon, will make damn sure he gets his grubby little hands on as many such power packs as imperially possible. Additionally, of course, the Monitorium realizes that in most cases, a Guardsman keeping a hold of two or three power packs for the entirety of a campaign and never having to need to reload his weapon more than two or three times is ever so slightly unreasonable as such, the vast majority of times that the Munitorium elements assigned to Imperial Guard regiments will usually allow Imperial Guardsmen to pretty much just raid their storage houses for whatever ammo they can carry, as long as they sign for it and as long as they are willing to uh, take the consequences of losing one of these precious pieces of the Machine God's blessing. Now. As I mentioned a little bit earlier, there are dozens, if not hundreds, if not thousands, of Lasgun variations, and I will get to at least a few of them in time. As such, while pretty much all Lasguns have at the very least some basic similarities, being all based on the same standard template construct, there are an incredible amount of variety within uh, the line of weapons. For example, some weapons come with fully automatic switches, allowing the weapon to fire full auto. Some don't. Some only allow their users to fire them single or burst shots. Some allow the user to uh, toggle on and off the weapon's boosted abilities. For example, a particular regiment had a weapon with a toggle on it that allowed the weapon to be set from standard Imperial LAS gun round to a weaker lasgun round intended for the suppression of civilian populace where, upon hitting a person, it would cause a really, really nice and solid scorch mark, but no fatal damage. 
all the way up to an extreme high powered version that will eventually burn out the barrel and cause pretty damn severe damage to the weapon. Not to quite the extent of a long lass's hotshot pack, but pretty severe regardless. This was designed specifically to deal with heavy targets. This particular regiment was a death world regiment as such. They were quite used to dealing with very, very large predators. The type of large where a single lasgun set to normal would scorch a minor hole in the thing and would only really piss it off essentially, making it relatively necessary for these regiments to have a way of risking the durability of their weapons in return for a far more guaranteed kill shot against the large gribblies that were trying to have them for dinner. Moving on, we come to the infantryman's ever trusty companion throughout the ages, the knife. In most cases, the knife is a simple piece of sharpened metal, used both for everyday chores and, of course, killing things. Most regiments also employ it as a bayonet, although many regiments often use specialized blades for this purpose, either out of tradition or customs or simply because they have developed one that works for their fighting style. For example, many feral worlds prefer longer, heavier sword-type bayonets, turning their weapons into essentially halberds, rather than the high-tech spear that the regular issue bayonet provides. Another trusty tool of the modern soldier is the 970 entrenching tool, a small folding spade used to make entrenchments, latrine pits, shoveling snow or sand, or any of the other myriad tasks to which you can use a shovel. Additionally, many regiments take quite a fondness to sharpening the rather heavy spade, insisting that it makes a far better close combat weapon than some spindly knife. Of course, many regiments also just flat out bring axes to the battlefield, so <laughs> in those cases they probably like the axes better. Continuing with the weaponry, the guard employs several types of grenades, but the most common variants are the frag and crack grenades. The frag grenade is your run-of-the-mill fragmentation grenade used for anti-infantry purposes, or fishing, depending on who you ask, while the crack grenade is an anti-tank weapon using a shaped explosive charge to punch holes in armoured vehicles or bunkers, or anything else heavily armoured. For example, Space Marines. Most of the time, Imperial Guardsmen are equipped with grenades on a mission-by-mission -mission basis. If they are expected to do heavy urban fighting, they're given more frag grenades. If they're expected to hold trench lines against enemy armour, they will be given crack grenades, etc. But, uh, much like the power packs, most Imperial Guardsmen will lie, beg, and steal to make sure he has as many of these grenades as he can. But the standard issue is one to two of each type if you're in a uncertain engagement. Of course, weapons are all well and good, but the Imperium has poured far too much time and money into uh, the average Imperial Guardsman to leave them completely unprotected. As such, most, though not all, regiments equip their troops with body armor. This can vary from simple flak vests or even chainmail to carapace armor, all the way up to fully powered exoskeletal armor, in the cases of the most advanced regiments. And in a few cases, as I kind of mentioned, there are regiments that just do not use armor. In most cases, this is simply because it would interfere with their given task. For example, the Katachan Devils, a jungle fighters extraordinaire, usually either don't wear armor at all, or they wear heavily modified flak vests, simply because a bulky piece of flak armor is going to get in the way pretty goddamn severely when you're trying to navigate a jungle filled with flesh-eating carnivorous plants and dinosaurs. In most cases though, the poor guardsman is going to have to make do with a standard flak vest and a helmet. And it may seem like inadequate protection for the battlefields of the 41st millennium, and frequently it is, but something is always better than nothing. 
And, of course, in most cases, body armor of the 41st millennium, at least when we're talking about Imperial Guardsmen, is not really designed to stop projectiles or to hinder injuries. It is simply there to lessen the injury and give the Imperial Guardsman that was so unlucky as to get hit a decent chance of surviving and fighting another day. This is not Space Marine power armor. This is not supposed to withstand the punishment of wandering into entire firing lines of enemy troops. It is simply there to hopefully, best case scenario, keep the troop er, fighting after a uh, hit or two, and worst case scenario, keep him alive for long enough for him to receive medical aid. And in addition to these instruments of war, the Imperial Guardsman is expected to care for himself during extended periods of deployment in the field. To this end, he is equipped with a single medipack, a simple tool and survival kit, and a combead, essentially a miniature radio receiver and sender placed in the air for use to communicate with the rest of the regiment. Along with his mess kit and water canteen with rations enough for usually two weeks as standard, a blanket, a sleeping bag, a rechargeable lamp pack, a grooming kit, his dog tags, and a copy of the Imperial Infantryman's Uplifting Primer, which is a basic guide that details everything a guardsman needs to know. Principles and regulations of the Imperial Guard, issued arms, attire, apparatus, and equipment, basic battlefield policy, and Imperial Guard organization and structure along with elementary battlefield medical instructions and a detailed <laughs> sorry a guide on the foes of the imperium or emergency toilet paper again depending on who you ask now of course no guardsman with any time in the field would ever be bringing all of that junk with him all the time and usually only bring what they think will be necessary and supplement their kit with various other gadgets and knickknacks, but the standard issue kit is of course meant to give uh, the guardsman all the things he might need, rather than a list of stuff he should carry with him wherever he bloody well goes. Uh, additionally, non-standard equipment might come in the form of respirators for operating in poor or downright toxic climates, or mines and demolition charges perhaps if the regiment is expected to take part in urban fighting. Many regiments also use specialized items, like for example, the Tarnith First and Only Regiment specialized in infiltration and stealth work, use so-called camo cloaks that are able to blend in nearly perfectly with the surrounding environment. There are of course a near whole host of various specialized gears, and I will be touching on a fair few of them when I get to individual regiments. But for now, moving on. In most cases, the gear of an officer is fairly similar to that of their troopers. But they are usually given an extra choice of weapons, and they're usually allowed to bring whatever weapons they see fit. They also are often offered a better armor, or the rights to bear symbolic weapons, like for example a melee weapon. Some regiments, for example, still use halberds to denote the rank of sergeant. They also give, uh, are given access to sidearms, be they normal las pistols, bolts pistols, plasma pistols, all kinds of stuff. Mostly depending on whatever the officer can scrounge for himself. Many regiments also have various ways to mark out officers in battle, like, for example, the aforementioned halberd, or a special hat, or a cape, for example. Additionally, the higher ranks of officers often, more or less officially, acquire additional gear, like power weapons, or plasma pistols, or even personal force fields, though this last item is usually reserved for generals and high command. But again, as we have already established, Imperial Guard personnel is not about lying, begging, stealing, and plundering whatever they can possibly get their hands on to increase their chances of surviving, for relatively obvious reasons. Now, we have the men, and we have the equipment, so let's have a look at the command elements of a regiment. 
At the top of the regiment is a single colonel, with a major serving as his second in command and his de facto aide. After this though, things get a hell of a lot more fluent, as regiments can consist of virtually any number of captains and lieutenants. Normally, each captain is in charge of two to four platoons, each platoon commanded by a lieutenant, but this can vary wildly with the size and composition of the regiment, and even the regiment's heritage and traditions. For example, from many feudal worlds with a strong nobility, there are often dozens of captains and lieutenants, and even in some cases majors, who serve little to no real purpose within the regiments. They are essentially there purely because their family expects them to be a high-ranking officer. And if the planet can't support enough regiments to give everyone an... Uh, appropriate title, then positions must simply be invented for them. In most cases, the Munitorium is willing to just let this slip simply because dealing with this kind of nonsense is just too goddamn much fucking paperwork. And then, of course, we come to the real leaders of any army, the NCOs, the non-commissioned officers where sergeants are put in charge of single squads and aided by a corporal. The standard squad consists of ten men and can be easily split into two units, one commanded by the sergeant and the other by the corporal. But as with most things in the Imperial Guard, this can vary wildly from regiment to regiment. In fact, in many armoured units it is customary to promote the driver and the gunner to the rank of corporal as a sign of prestige, just to, you know, bring them out of the muck of their normal foot-slogging filth. Yuck. And in some feral regiments, the corporal, and in a few extreme cases the sergeant, is decided by mock combat, fought with what may or may not be sharp weapons depending on just how feral the regiment is. Then we have a whole mess of various attached personnel. The most common and indeed required of these is the Commissar. The Commissarot and its workings is a video all in and of itself, but all you really need to know in the context of the Imperial Guard is that they are political officers, responsible for maintaining order and discipline within the regiments through whatever means they deem necessary. If you don't know what a political officer is, well, compare them to the Commissars of the Red Army of World War II, for example. And, of course, when I say every means necessary, that does indeed include summary executions. The Commissar exists outside the regimental hierarchy of the Imperial Guards in terms of command, and Unless they have a double rank, for example, the famous Colonel Commissar Ibrahim Gont. This is an extreme rarity, though. The Commissars can, however, take temporary command over a unit, or indeed an entire regiment, if it finds itself without a leader. If, for example, the Commissar has just shot said leader for cowardice or any other reason he might deem suitable. And then there is the Adeptus Mechanicus with its various attached groups of tech priests and engine seers. These are also considered outside the authority of the guard itself and even commissars cannot discipline them like he can Imperial Guard personnel. As such, the Mechanicus elements have no command authority over even the lowest Imperial Guardsmen. But, nevertheless, most regiments put in place standing orders for all guardsmen to protect and help Mechanicus personnel in any way they can, as without the Mechanicum, the regiment cannot remain operational for very long. Then there is the Psychers. In extreme circumstances, regiments may have representatives of the Adeptus Astra Telepathica attached to them 
However, such a posting holds great dangers for both the Psyker and the men around him, and is usually only done if the regiment in question is expected to be in direct contact with enemy Psykers or warplay related magics. These Psykers are also not under the command of the regiment they are attached to, although they are usually instructed to carry out objectives that correlate to the unit they will be supporting, and unlike the Adeptus Mechanicus elements, the Psyker is most definitively within the Commissar's pure view. In fact, with the attachment of a Psyker, the Commissar's primary duty becomes to watch over the Psyker for any signs of unusual activity and to put a stop to it with a well-placed bullet if needs be. Then there are various members of the Adeptus Ministorum that are attached, or in most cases simply attached themselves, to Imperial Guard regiments. These priests and confessors tend to the spiritual well-being of the regiment, and remind the men of their holy duty to burn and cleanse and burn and cleanse and be, in general, extremely violent towards anything that is not human. This may in some cases seem to be a somewhat pointless thing to have in an army, but it must be remembered that the average Imperial Guardsman is pretty goddamn religious, and the presence of a priest can be of great comfort to them. And the priests also fill a limited military role in their ability to rile up the men with holy fervour, and convince them of their holy purpose to, as we have already discussed, maim and burn in the name of the God Emperor. Lastly, we will leave behind all the command and various attached echelons, and proceed to the Grunts, the good old foot sloggers. The um, basic Imperial Guardsman is divided into two classes. You might refer to it as private and private first class. There is the regular guardsman who was trained and mustered on his homeworld and is usually a veteran of the local PDF, the Planetary Defense Force, and this guardsman is usually a volunteer, as the guard is normally formed from the best of the PDF, though in cases of lacking patriotic spirit, the Imperium most certainly do not shy away from a little good old-fashioned conscription. And uh, then there's the conscript, or uh, probitors as they are known officially, and usually referred to by their new comrades in considerably less flattering terms. For example, meat shields. This class of guardsmen must not be confused with conscripted regular guardsmen, though. The conscript is essentially a civilian, given minimal training and pressed into duty to replace combat losses and man secondary defensive lines or carry out guard or garrison duty. Most arrangements do make an effort to train and fully integrate these new bloods wherever possible, though of course trained replacements from their own world are always preferred. Some regiments, though, employ these new boots as, well, meat shields, essentially, yet others will classify all new recruits, even conscripts from their own planets, as probitors until they have proven themselves worthy in battle. An example of this would be the Cadian White Shields. These new men are not allowed to display their regimental colours or insignia on their uniforms until they have passed this test. And the test can vary greatly. Some regiments simply require them to survive their first battle and, you know, not run away, while others require, for example, a show of bravery, or perhaps that they kill an enemy and bring back a trophy, for example. Some regiments go even further, demanding that a new recruit must kill an enemy in melee combat before he can be accepted as a member of the regiment. Now, having gone through the Imperial Guard Regiment, I figured I should also touch upon the higher echelons of Imperial Guard Command. Above the regiment, we enter the ranks of the High Command, 
with a general, usually being in charge of three or more regiments, though there's little standardization of command size above the rank of Kern, simply due to the extreme variations in size and scale of Imperial Guard operations. Above the general, we find the first Lord rank, namely that of Lord General Militant, a position usually entrusted with the management of an entire theatre of operations. This theatre can, however, vary quite remarkably in size, from a single continent, to a planet, to a solar system, or in even some extreme cases, multiple solar systems. In most cases, this will be the highest ranking local officer in areas of um, relative peace and quiet, well, by Imperial standards anyway. Above him again comes the Lord Commander, of which there are five, each being responsible for one of the segmentum of the Imperium. This is primarily an Imperial Navy posting, with the Imperial Guard actions usually carried out by the local Lord General Militant. And finally, at the top of the command shrine, we find the Lord Commander Militant, the Supreme Commander of the Imperial Guard and one of the High Lords of Terra. There is, though, one further title I should mention, that comes in kinda between that of Lord Commander Militant and Lord General Militant, namely the title of War Master. Though after the Horus Heresy, the title of War Master is often replaced with the title of Lord Solar, due to the somewhat unfortunate history of the War Master title. A Lord Solar is the officer in charge of an Imperial Crusade, a massive undertaking that can include forces from dozens of Lord General militants, and in many cases even draw strength from multiple segmenta. Additionally, such an undertaking is also frequently supported by non-Imperial Guard elements, like the Adeptus Astartes or Mechanicum forces, like the Scitari and the Titan Legions. And it is the Lord Solar's job to keep all of these hundreds, if not thousands, of regiments and non-Imperial Guard forces all pulling in the same direction, making the position as much about politics as it is about military matters. Having gone over all that, let us lastly look at why an Imperial Guard regiment is created. We have already talked about how it is created, and mentioned that many worlds create regiments at a fixed speed, for example, one per year, etc. But in many cases, regiments are raised not as part of the annual tithe, but as a part of the way in which the Imperium reacts to threats. I talked about this in the Imperium video as well, but to reiterate quickly, if an Imperial world comes under attack and the local PDF is not up to the task of defending it, they call for help. And this call is first answered by nearby guard regiments on garrison duty or simply standing by. If this is not enough to contain the threat, the call for help is sent further away from the planet, bringing in more forces and possibly also rerouting regiments destined for other war zones. If that still is not enough, and no more free regiments can be found, then nearby worlds are required to muster new regiments. And this call also then goes out in stages, with nearby planets being asked first, then planets further away, etc. etc. This lets the Imperium respond flexibly to threats, and also try to counter a threat with a bare minimum of force. The Imperium is, after all, a very, very big place and constantly under attack, so economy of motion is extremely important. In extreme cases of large-scale threats, this stage-by-stage -stage response also serves a second purpose. If a truly huge threat appears and carves deeply into the Imperium, 
the call will have gone out far enough to muster whole armies at a safe distance from the war zone. These forces can then be organized into a massive counterattack, whose goal is to sweep onwards to the last worlds and reclaim them all for the Imperium. I'm going to wrap up the video here. You may consider this the basics of the Imperial Guard, and there will be various videos on regiments, weapons, vehicles, etc. coming, and of course do feel free to suggest video topics in the comments. I have been Arch, thank you very much for watching, and I hope to see you soon. Have a good day.